Hi, everybody. Hello. Hoping, Can you hear or see us? Hoping it will work now. I think what went down is the software which um, allows us to put the your comments up on the screen. So we're coming to you straight from Facebook. Mm -hmm. Hoping, hoping you can migrate over here. Is it? They, they were already here. They were here ooh, all along. Ooh. So unless it's our internet. Um, oh, someone's, oh, someone, someone, see, someone said hello. Oh, Rachel. Oh, Rachel, Thank can you, you see and hear us? And, and okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. so excited. Oh, Kathy, go a second. And spider and spider and does whatever a spider and can. Happy birthday. birthday. Yay, Donna! Yay! Emma. Emily did show up! Yes! So now we are in a brave new world where we cannot show you your yeah. comments on the screen. We just have to trust that we understand each other. It's like yeah. old school Facebook life. Julianne is here, and Emma, and Cindy, and Anne, and Joyce, and everybody's here. People's is here. I'm going to let you get started because we're late. Yeah. And um, I will. Sorry about that snafu, in, folks. In a while. All right. So today. <laughs> Nick, poor Nick, he came in and he was like, no man. And I said, I know, no man. And then he said, I'm still the only man. And I said, I know, it's so sad. It's because you've gotten yourself into a nest of lesbians. But we love you. We love the men. So I hope that there are lots more men coming in. I'm talking about a book by a man today. It's called <laughs> How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain. Now, this guy, Andrew Newberg, and his co-author, Mark Robert Waldman. Um, Mark Robert Waldman, I have not read his work before, but I've re been reading Andrew Newberg for years and years and years, because when the very first functional MRI studies came out about um, what happens in the brains of meditators, he was the dude who did it. And he wrote a book called Why God Won't Go Away, uh, which was really pivotal in my understanding of spirituality because he was looking for what happens in mystical experience to the brain and he found that there is an, there are parts of the brain that are connected even in other animals to unusual behaviors like for example if you take a bird like a stork it might do a mating dance and have a special mating call and that enables it to connect with another bird and make more little storks and according to some people human babies but that's very weird so if you're still confused about that go ask someone anyway these patterns of motion and certain calls create experiences in the brain that allow for a feeling of union with another we call it falling in love well it just so happens that that part of the brain is contiguous to another part, which is involved in uh, the dissolution of the sense of self and this feeling of oneness with everything. And so it basically his book said, God won't go away because um, there's a part of the brain that all that is actually grasping something called the mystery in many traditions, uh, something divine, something spiritual, and it was interesting because he wrote that book with Eugene Dakili, who it, who passed away before the book was published. And by the end of the book, instead of saying that the that spirituality is always generated by the brain, he said, or Andrew Newberg, who was left to tell the tale, actually came out as believing that the brain was actually perceiving something real. So just like the senses, the other five senses can perceive real things. There is an aspect of the brain that, especially given certain behaviors, opens itself to perceiving spirituality, or, or and, and we have these consistent experiences of the divine over all different times and cultures and, um, and religious beliefs. So the, the experience of spirituality um, is, a, is a sense of a real thing, according to his belief in that book. Now, he's in this, in the years since he's gone all in people and it's so funny because i remember when i was 10 or 11 years old thinking i know i'm meant to be part of something different i know i'm meant to be part of a change in the something something and then i thought i mean this was years of preoccupation as a kid going what am i supposed to help with what am i supposed to help with it's a change in the way people think 
So then I was like, by 12, I was like, it's a change in the way people think. I was like, okay, what is that? What kind of a change? And so I started looking for ways that the brain could, or the mind could change to be open to new things. And that's one reason I became a sociologist. But about five years ago, as many of you know, I, I got focused on the idea that the thing called enlightenment in, the, in Asia is the transformation that I have been sensing needs to happen to many people on the face of the earth in the next little while. And while I was thinking this in my little pocket of the world in Provo, Utah growing up, other people were thinking it too. And they were going toward the same, the same uh, goal. I don't know if it's really a goal. It, it's almost a sense of predestination or a mission, a vision. Anyway, so then when I got, I was over 50 when I finally dared to say out loud, I think it's this thing called enlightenment. Because here's, here's why I was afraid to say it. In some of the Asian teachings, it says, imagine that a hawk flies over the top of Mount Everest once a year or once every hundred years or something ridiculous with a silk scarf in its beak. And as it goes across the mountain, the scarf just grazes the mountain. In the time it takes the silk scarf to wear away the mountain, you may attain enlightenment. So in other words, as Ram Dass said in one of his lectures, are you going to be enlightened in this lifetime? No, now you can relax. So I was really like, I really bought that. And by the time I was in my 50s, I went through a really agonizing period where I got extremely anxious and depressed. And the only thing that would calm me down was reading these books about enlightenment. And it's a real dramatic change in the brain that takes people beyond suffering permanently. So I thought this was pretty radical that I was going around saying, I thought this could happen to people like a lot of people. And then I realized, oh, that's what Eckhart Tolle is talking about too. And he thinks it's going to happen to a lot of people. So maybe I'm not alone. I know Deepak Chopra believes the same thing. Well, now Andrew Newberg has written a book where he basically says, okay, Enlightenment consists of a certain thing in the brain, happening in the brain, and you can't force it, but you can definitely induce it. So after decades of reading Asian writers who are like, you know, contemplate the mystery, and, you know, the, the moon, the moon we see in, in your mind is not the moon, but the moon you see in the sky is projected from the mind. I mean, all these sort of radical theological or, or deeply spiritual sounding things. This book is so American. It's like, okay, here's where it goes. It's point A and point B in the brain. And this is how, what makes it do it. Okay, so let's do it. And then we will all be enlightened. And it's kind of, it's kind of sweet and funny in a way to see how nuts and bolts we Americans are like, yeah, we're gonna build it. Si se puede. So, I was thrilled by this, and I, I just read this book today, and um, basically, I'll tell you what he says. There are two parts of the brain. The frontal lobe, you can touch it with your fingers, and then if you touch with your thumbs on the back of your head, the parietal lobe, and those two things, the frontal lobe has to do with your sense of control, being able to control yourself, control the world, control things that happen. The parietal lobe controls the sense of being separate and being able to tell yourself from other things. So what happens in enlightenment is that processes like meditation, but many, actually many mystical practices, and I'll talk about some of those in a second, what they do is they cause an increase in activity in those two areas. So if you go into meditation, you have more of a sense of control. Actually, you build control by sitting completely still and not allowing your body or even your mind to wander. And you get more and more sense of self-control as time goes by. In the parietal lobe, as you, as you do that, as you focus on looking within, your awareness of self goes up, goes up, goes up. So you're now getting more control and more of a sense of self. That's half the equation. And we know how to do that half. Like meditation will reliably do that, and will, so will a number of other practices. Enlightenment, with a big E, occurs 
and this is what Newberg says, when the activity in both the parietal and the, and the frontal lobes decreases dramatically, they kind of shut down actually. And so they've been building, 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 and then they go quiet. And at that point, you lose all sense of being an isolated self, and you also lose all sense of control. And you feel like you're being taken on a ride somewhere. And one of the ways people experience this is with um, psychedelics or with MDMA. Um, but here's the interesting thing. They only experience that if they go into the substance experience wanting it to lead them to enlightenment. If, not, if it's a party drug, it's just a party. It doesn't lead to enlightenment. So I wouldn't, I'm not suggesting those things, they're illegal. Um, but what they do is they drop the activity in those, those two areas of the brain and you feel like you, that's why they say it's, you're going on a trip. I guess LSD would do the same thing. He didn't mention it, but I've heard people say that. I don't know, don't have any interest in that myself. But here are some other things that reliably drop the energy in the parietal and frontal lobes and create, he calls it enlightenment with a little e. You can have these experiences where you, you, you see something new and fresh and your understanding is a little bit open. Or it can lead to enlightenment with a big e. He says it's like the difference between you, you climb up a cliff, that's where you're building, building, building. So meditation, you're climbing a cliff. And then for some unknown reason, you fall or you can induce falling. Uh, and when you fall, the sense of control is gone. And the further you've built up, the farther you fall. And if you fall, say you're falling into water, if you've gone a long way up, you fall very deep down into a completely new environment where everything looks, sounds, tastes, feels different. And you have a completely new experience. And to someone who'd never been in water, you couldn't describe it. That was his analogy. It's not perfect. Analogies never are. But that's the thing about enlightenment, you can't really describe it. Okay, so I said I'd tell you about some of the ways to do this, and it's very exciting. I did a couple of these techniques today in my meditation, and I literally thought I'd been sitting there five minutes. I could not believe that my timer went off. For, I sat for half an hour. I did my usual meditation, and then I read the book, and I was like, oh, I gotta try this. So I meditated for another half hour, and it, bam, I could not believe how fast the time went by. So the first thing, you set a clear intention that what you want is to be enlightened. You want to transcend suffering. You want to understand what your the deal is about being a spiritual being and a human, sorry, a spiritual being having a human experience instead of vice versa. You set the intention that that is what you want. And I know a lot of you guys here have done that. The next thing you do is relax. And here is the wacky way I used today, and it worked. You yawn 10 times. So if you may have to start out faking it, like, oh, 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 oh. but when it catches and you do a full yawn, it took me five minutes to get 10 full yawns. I've read in other literature that there's a patch at the back of your throat kind of that is sensitive to nitrogen. And when you yawn, it gets more nitrogen and it resets the biochemistry of the brain. So do that 10 times. By that time, I'm already feeling a little like, whoa, this is getting trippy. Then you do a very, very, very slow neck roll. So you do basically one of these that you'd do if you were just tired or whatever. But you do it so it takes a full 60 seconds to do one neck roll and you pay absolutely intricate attention to every little twinge, every little bit of tightness. And here's the interesting thing, the attention alone, not the rolling, but the attention relaxes the muscle. And you start to get, and if you roll your head again later, it's much looser, it worked, it was super cool. So I did the yawning, I did the neck roll. Then you can just sit, if you want to, or you can do, to, if to amp it up, chanting is really powerful. Remember what I said about the birds and the bird calls that they use when they're mating? Om is, it's a cliche for a reason, folks. There's something about the vibration of the sound, om, that is really, really powerful to the brain and to the body. So you can sit there and do, just chant om, 
for as many minutes as you want. The meditation for the meditation to drop you into a place that feels like enlightenment with a little e takes 50 to 60 minutes of just pure sitting meditation. If you chant, apparently it takes less time. I was in a room with other people, so I didn't chant anything out loud, but I did in my head. And I also did this, uh, there's a, a practice where you go satana you tap your fingers and you say satana ma, satana ma. I hope I'm doing that right. If not, that's what I was using, satana ma. It doesn't really mean anything to me, but it's, it forces the body as well as the mind into this state. Now, from what he says, Andrew Newbert, by far the most powerful way you can do this is to use a, a, what they use in the Sufi tradition, the Sufi mystics of the Middle East, which is to either rock or, or twirl. And uh, I have known, Adam had a friend in San Luis Obispo who used to dance in a circle all the time, and she was a mystic kid, that, and she, her whole family were mystical dancers. If you like to dance and you don't mind moving your body, chanting while either rocking, swaying, or turning in circles, apparently it just makes your brain go kaploom, and um, all the effects that are in, uh, associated with enlightenment with a little E are met, and you have these very divine experiences. I got pretty high just saying satanama for 30 minutes in my head after yawning 10 times and rolling my head slowly. That's not much of a price to pay for a really great experience. And then the last thing I want to say before I take a few questions, I know they can't go up on the screen, but maybe I can get the badger, the gracious badger Rowan Mangan, to bring up some questions and just tell me about them. So the other thing I wanted to tell you, and he doesn't say this here, but if you read the, his research, they found that people who are willing to let go of their beliefs are much more likely to experience enlightenment with a big E. And in fact, Andrew Newberg himself had this massive experience that changed his life forever that he considers to have been an enlightenment experience. And it was when he encountered what he calls infinite doubt. He, he was obsessed with finding out what was true. And then one day he was, he'd been obsessing about this for years. And one day he just had this breakthrough where he realized nothing could be perceived as absolute. And he called it infinite doubt. And it, Made, it filled him with joy and happy and compassion and love for himself and all men and women and animals and everybody in between. So infinite doubt sounds a little improbable, but in Asia they call that don't know mind. And as I've said before, Rene Descartes, when he said, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, the actual whole quote was dubito cogito ergo sum, I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. So the ability to acknowledge that we don't actually know much, <laughs> the ability to release beliefs is what's necessary for enlightenment with a biggie. And he says, most people, if they had enlightenment with a biggie, it would explode all their beliefs and they would like feel like their arms and legs had fallen off. So if you can sort of sneak up on it by releasing your beliefs one at a time, you get closer. And I thought this is why Byron Katie's work is so powerful. It erodes, it, 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 it just immolates one painful belief after another until the whole structure of belief is ready to collapse. When it collapses, I believe, that's when people achieve enlightenment with a big E. I don't know. I hope it happens to y'all and you can tell me. Okay, Gracious Badger. Present. I, do, I did take a lot of time. That's all right. Um, so questions will be read out today and not, not displayed on the screen. Um, Daisy asked a little earlier, she asked, do you think you can become enlightened on antidepressants? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you can become enlightened on almost anything. There's a famous story about a Zen master who had a, an American acolyte who did a lot of LSD. And the Zen master said, I want to try LSD. So the acolyte gave him a dose, a regular dose, and he was like, mm, nah, not much happening. So he gave him, he doubled the dose. Eh, nah. Eventually he gave him six times a dose that would have sent any normal person's head like traveling the universe, never to return. And the Zen master was like, yeah, no difference. So 
whatever was going on in that man's brain, and by the way, there are some Zen meditation tricks that you can use to, to create these brain states too. I just didn't talk about them because they're not as exciting. <laughs> um, you stare at a piece of paper. It's amazing. Um, but I believe that even in the fog of chemical altering, you can find a way. That said, if you're on a drug that makes it, if you feel like it's harder for you to think straight, respect that, have love for yourself, talk to your doctor about getting off it. Um, but I believe in many cases, it could probably enhance it by keeping you from fixating on negative thoughts, which have been shown to create brain states that prohibit enlightenment. That's what I think. I think you are right. And I usually do think that. That's why I keep her around. <laughs> Excuse me. Donna asks, what happens after enlightenment with a little e? How do you transfer that into non-meditative states? The difference between, according to Newberg, between enlightenment with a big E and a little e is that enlightenment with a big E means that you are never the same person again. It permanently alters major features of your personality and your behavior. So a little e is where you have a wonderful experience, but it fades. And the best way, I've had lots of these. I think all of them, I think every person has had these and um, some of us pay more attention than others. But when I have one, one of the things I do in sitting meditation is that I lock onto them. Like if I've had an insight the other night, oh my gosh, I'll tell you guys all about this later. I went out and meditated for two hours as the sun went down in the forest outside my house. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, and I watched the fireflies come out and it was super magical. And then I got into this very deep state and I felt this burst of love. And I looked up and this stag was walking past me and he was just magnificent. And then I thought, I wish the fireflies would come play with me. And from all around they flew and they came and they flew around my head and sparked. And then I said, okay, how about an owl? I swear to God. <laughs> a huge bird flew from the corner of my eye across my visual field and did not make a sound. So it had to have been an owl. It was dark, but what else is flying around soundlessly at night? Anyway, um, Batman. It, it was Batman. Yay. What was the question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh yeah. Making it last. Yeah. So you better believe that I, sit down and focus on experiences like that over and over and over so it wears tracks in my brain. Oh, those of you who are in Ride Into Light, this is amazing. I mean, next year's Ride Into Light, I am gonna really amp it up because writing exercises are some of the most powerful ways that you can keep an enlightenment experience. And I'm gonna be citing Newberg right, left and center because a lot of the exercises we're already doing are a part of what he says and use it, writing down the experience over and over and using tricks like saying, I'm gonna write as a divine consciousness and just pretend, stuff like that can be really, really powerful too for changing the brain. So, and weirdly it shuts down the language center while creating a flow of words. Go figure that. It's very exciting. Very exciting. So yeah, try it. I have a question here from Laurie that I absolutely love. She says, once enlightened, then what? Well, the famous Zen saying is, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, daily chores. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, or as Jack Cornfield puts it, after the ecstasy, the laundry. So there's no difference between the way a person seems to behave after enlightenment from the outside. From the inside, it is a radically different world. From the outside, it's just a person chopping wood and carrying water. But from the inside, it is the divine itself experiencing every moment as its own creation of the universe and experiencing every drop of water as the first drop of water in the history of the universe and every piece of wood as the first piece of wood and every tree as the first tree. And unity with everything. Um, Byron Katie's daughter told me a story about Katie cutting herself on a food processor um, right after her enlightenment experience. And she was bleeding all over and everything. And it 
frightened the family, but Kay just kept saying, there's no harm, we're one, we're one. It's me, we're one. And Roxanne said, now I, got, I have to go to high school and tell my friends that my mother thinks she's a food processor. Roxanne's very funny, like Katie. Um, and, and that's another thing. Lightness, humor, joy comes into everything. Um, there's still emotion, but the person who felt rocked and shaken by emotion has been replaced by this infinite, capacious, luminous stillness in which nothing can ever be harmed. And there's an absolute sense of well-being. There's a dramatic decline in fear of death and fear of pain and fear of loss and just generally fear. And instead you get this incredibly vivid experience of the world, um, just God looking through your eyes going, wow, this was worth the ticket. <laughs> this ride is worth the ticket must be this tall to enter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know we started late, so, so I kind of wanted to go late, but we can stop if, you, if everybody wants. I think they would like a couple more. All right. <laughs> so I have one from Matt Weeks here. I think he says, can you speak to the ordinariness of enlightenment as opposed to what it's seeming here, which is difficult or even needing chemical assistance to oh, get no. closer? Mm -mm. Um, which is his reading of what you were saying earlier. He said, I think it's easier than this session is suggesting. Oh, yeah. I mean, people, like I said, it's just usually, usually people just fall into it. That said, the people who fall into it often have suffered a lot. So it's not a state that people go into just, be, you know, just an ordinary person like on vacation at the beach suddenly experiences enlightenment. That happens. Ramana Maharshi was just sitting around one day when he was 19 and he, enlightenment happened to him. But it's kind of frustrating to wait to experience enlightenment as something that just happens to some people and we have no way to control it. And well, of course we can't control it, but no way to induce it, no way to cultivate it. <laughs> um, the ordinariness of it, once it's happened, people experience it as and, and I have had this, I, this was one of my little E enlightenments. And, and as I said, those happen to everybody every day. And you definitely do not need drugs. I'm just saying they don't necessarily have to get in the way. But um, one of my little E's was I was sitting there having this incredible experience of the natural world and thinking, I want to take a picture of this with my phone. And then I thought, no. I don't have to attach to this because every single moment is this beautiful. So nothing special, instead of making everything seem flat and dead, meant to me that nothing is not absolutely divine and illuminated. So everything is perfect. Therefore, nothing is more special than anything else. Mm. And then that enabled me to start to have experiences of bliss at times when I was having an argument with someone or I was disappointed, or I mean, times when I usually found it hard, I could suddenly look at that experience and go, no, this is as beautiful as a moment of absolute rapturous love. This is as beautiful as a poem. It's all beautiful. It's all beautiful. So yeah, and the more little E enlightenments we have, the more likely we are to have a big E. The little E's are really quite easy to create. And they make everything extraordinary so that nothing's special. And then the biggie, I think, happens when we've eroded our attachment to our beliefs. Mm. Byron Katie said, people tell me they want to be enlightened because they think it will give them everything they want. And she said, if only they knew, it would, it would, it's going to take everything away. And I was like, hmm. But what's left after everything of the self goes away is this incredible experience of eternal delight. And um, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that in others. I've seen the top of the mountain from my own low vantage point, and I believe it's there. And I believe it's there for all of us. I think there may be people out there that are, are listening that are very, very close to completely enlightened, if not already there. I don't know. Absolutely. Maybe that's why we're gathering. So try, try these methods, see if they work, see if they give you at least what they gave me was a really 
fun morning. Yeah. <laughs> that was really fun. You guys just yawn 10 times, roll your head around, and then say something for half an hour. It's not difficult, and it changes everything. So much love to you. We will see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Until you're enlightened or not. It's all good either way. Just make sure you do the laundry. That's my take. The laundry. That's the key. Okay. Do the laundry. See you guys. Bye.